uh, to welcome you all to the 18th webinar uh, on ethics and COVID on behalf of the George Washington University's Milken Institute School of Public Health, and in particular, the Office of Research Excellence and the Bioethics Interest Group. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today. This actually is going to be our final webinar for the calendar year of 2020, and I couldn't be excited uh, at both the topic and the speakers that I have uh, to close this calendar year out before we go on our uh, winter break and come back in January. Um, we are actually kickstarting a new theme in this webinar series. As you know, we have covered many specific topics of relevance to ethics and COVID-19. We've also started a theme where we are going around the world. We've already been to Asia, parts of Asia and parts of Africa. We hope to continue that, uh, our travels into Latin America and the Middle East soon. Uh, but today we kickstart a new theme on faith and COVID-19. What we hope to do is to bring different faith traditions and talk a little bit about what are the issues that COVID-19 as a pandemic has raised uh, with respect to um, the faith communities. Uh, they could be at the intersection of a number of different sectors, including health, access, equity, social justice, availability of uh, uh, vaccines and medicines, and many, many more things. I'm really excited that we will have uh, at least two, if not more, faith traditions represented today. Um, and I'll immediately get started. Um, Kathleen, if we can take down the opening slide. I want to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Zainab Chaudhry. Dr. Chaudhry is the spokeswoman and Maryland director for the Council on American Islamic Relations. Uh, for those who don't know, that's America's largest Muslim civil rights organization. I'm also very proud uh, that Zainab uh, sits on the Maryland State Advisory Committee to the US Commission on Civil Rights. She's a fellow of the American Muslim Civic Leadership Institute, and most importantly, close to home, also sits in the Howard County Racial Equity Task Force. I have seen and uh, the work of Zainab and her organization very closely. Um, I'm very excited that uh, she is with us today. And uh, Zainab, we look forward to hearing a little bit of your perspectives uh, from the Islamic relations, uh, Muslim community perspective on uh, ethics, COVID-19, and what's going on today. So over to you for a round of opening comments. Zainab, I think you're on mute, and uh, you, I think, can share your slides as well. Okay, great. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, lovely. I appreciate the, uh, the heads up with the new button. Sometimes it's a little bit interesting working with technology. So thank you again uh, to the Office of Research Excellence at the Milken Institute of Public Health at George Washington University. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here today with all of you to discuss a very relevant, very timely topic. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the impact of COVID on faith-based communities from an American Muslim perspective. Um, so obviously, as we know, this pandemic has taken a devastating toll on every aspect of our lives, and the numbers really speak for themselves. Um, the latest that I saw on Sunday, December 6th, we saw um, that unfortunately, you know, this pandemic has caused over 280,000 deaths in our country. Over 200,000 new cases are being reported daily. Um, and unfortunately, about 2,000 deaths are now being reported daily. So this continues to take a very heavy toll um, on our country and globally as well. A couple last week, actually, the director of the CDC, Dr. Robert Redfield, uh, he gave a very dismal premonition, indicating that the next few months are going to be um, probably the most uh, devastating public health crisis of our country. Um, and I think that that really speaks to you know the gravity of of this pandemic and what we are facing in the coming weeks. From a faith-based perspective, um, you know, faith-based communities have been amongst the most hardest hit of other communities. And this is especially unfortunate because we know during times of crisis, um, many of us rely on our faith to help us navigate the challenges that these crises um, you know, propose to us. Um, and so what some, some of the ways that we've seen faith-based communities being impacted are the cancellation or restriction of in-person worship services, um, instructional content, including Quran classes and Bible study, um, wedding ministry services, restrictions on funeral services. And I'll go a little bit more into this in the coming slides that I have uh, prepared for this presentation, as well as pil pilgrimages, ceremonies, and festivals. Um, this year in 2020 was the first time that the annual pilgrimage to Mecca, which is incumbent upon Muslims who are able-bodied and are able to afford it, was canceled for individuals who reside outside of Saudi Arabia. Um, and so this was really like, you know, very um, 
groundbreaking development. It was something that I think a lot of people didn't see coming, but I think it really speaks to the fact that there are um, so many different precautions that countries are taking uh, to protect um, themselves and prevent the spread of the virus. Um, also, fundraising has been impacted, um, especially for faith-based institutions who rely on donors to be able to sustain operations. They've also had to think outside of, of the box and really kind of reassess how they are collecting funding um, in their operations. Of course, uh, holy sites have had restricted access as well. Um, and travel restrictions, both domestically and internationally, have wreaked havoc with individuals who have been trying to fulfill certain tenets of their faith. Specifically, um, you know, with the ethical considerations as it pertains to um, the impact of COVID on faith-based communities, racial disparities has been a very big factor. Um, in Maryland specifically, we know that Black and Hispanic populations have been disproportionately impacted, but we see this manifesting across the country in different cities. During a public hearing um, before in, the, in the Maryland General Assembly in September, data was presented that indicated that there was staggering, um, you know, uh, staggering dis uh, disparity in how these different communities were being impacted. And this directly really relates to the access to PPE, face masks, uh, you know, uh, other forms of uh, protective equipment for uh, especially frontline workers. Uh, resources, testing facilities have also um, been, uh, you know, uh, something that has uh, tie been tied into the fact that racial disparities have disproportionately impacted, especially communities of color, um, access to adequate health care, um, and now food, right? We're seeing a growing food crisis within our country uh, where individuals in certain, especially disadvantaged and underprivileged uh, communities are having difficulty being able to access food. And so from a faith-based perspective, we're seeing houses of worship who are um, kind of changing the focus of the services that they provide. And I know many mosques, for example, have started organizing food drives and they're offering, um, you know, in a very safe and sanitary way, they're offering food to those who individuals were, um, you know, might be furloughed from a job from their work where they can't afford to make a grocery. We've also seen um, houses of worship have had to really kind of reevaluate the way that they maintain operations in the sense where with maintenance and security. Um, even though many mosques, for example, across Maryland and different parts of the country have um, closed their daily prayer services, they have canceled daily prayer services uh, in order to maintain the property there are still staff who have to attend and be there physically on site. Um, so that has also been a consideration. Of course, establishing a timeline for resuming services has also been a factor. Uh, many, um, for example, in Maryland, many uh, faith leaders were concerned when Governor Hogan announced that there would be a 50% uh, resumption of attendance at, at any faith gatherings at um, houses of worship in uh, earlier in fall. And so faith leaders convened to or write an open letter to the governor asking him to reconsider that. Um, and of course, limiting attendance at Janaza or funeral services and Nagao wedding. weddings has been a huge um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, issue that many mosque leaders and other faith leaders have had to contend with because of the pandemic. Enforcing social distancing during rituals and services has also been uh, a big deal. Um, in, in the Islamic faith tradition, when Muslims pray, we pray shoulder to shoulder, feet to feet. Um, and oftentimes worshipers, they greet each other with hugs, they shake hands. Um, and this has all been, you know, completely uh, forbidden now um, in the course of, you know, since March when we started seeing the uptick in the number of cases in our country. Um, in mosques where they have allowed some limited amount of worshipers to enter, they, um, in many cases, they are screening worshipers, they, are, they have a thermometer at the door, they're doing temperature checks, um, they're encouraging, uh, you know, worshipers to bring their own prayer mats. Uh, because that just for sanitary reasons to avoid spreading germs, they have closed access in many cases to restrooms. So they are encouraging those who need to wash up before they pray, do the ablution, um, to do that at home and then come to the mosque. But uh, very many mosques have actually limited or completely shut down services. So um, many Muslims, members of the Muslim community are praying at home. Uh, one of the other considerations obviously has been, uh, you know, objects at houses of worship, which individ individuals touch. So like texts or prayer beads or electronics, worship aids, um, any item that's passed among congregants. I was speaking with a friend of mine uh, at a Presbyterian church and she was saying how, you know, in some cases for some churches that actually co do collections, they have had to revisit the idea of, of passing around a collection plate for offerings during uh, ceremonies or, or during the services. 
Um, and also enforcing contact tracing protocols, right? This has been a big challenge um, for many houses of worship in terms of how they can ensure that if, God forbid, there is an exposure um, of, to somebody who is tested positive, how can we make sure that anybody who comes in contact with them is notified and is um, you know, in, informed that they need to quarantine. And being able to mandate that these protocols are adhered to is also a challenge that um, houses of worship have had to take into consideration. Also, uh, you know, some, in some cases, especially you know, with the Sikh faith community, uh, oftentimes um, food is a big part of the faith and they often offer uh, food during services um, and so the way that, you know, meals, if meals are being offered, the way that they get to are, um, are offered has changed drastically. So no buffets, no family style meals. I know one mosque in Maryland, for example, had prepackaged box meals um, that they had like a drive-through uh, distribution. They had worshipers at their congregation come and drive through and pick up uh, boxed foods that were prepared in a sanitary way. And so there has been some resistance, obviously, um, in these kind of situations when people see, you know, the, the crisis that we're in and the, the kind of impact that it has on our society. Uh, people are more often compelled, oftentimes, to want to go to their mosques or church or synagogue or house of worship um, because that's where they feel spiritually rejuvenated. They find comfort. They find solace. So for many faith leaders, they have had to grapple with kind of encouraging their communities on staying away from the house of worship, which is counterintuitive in many cases. So Kira has worked with the Baltimore City Health Department, for example, to launch a campaign uh, where we raise awareness with Ramadan, encouraging people to worship at home. Ramadan is the holiest month of the year for the, in the Islamic faith tradition. Um, it's oftentimes where Muslims go to the mosque multiple times a day. Um, and it's really a time of spiritual rejuvenation. And so we pulled a uh, hadith, which is a prophetic saying, um, and the Baltimore City Health Department shared this with the community uh, giving evidence and examples of how in the Islamic faith tradition, it was discouraged to actually attend uh, you know, services in person when there is a public health crisis. Uh, so four of the national Muslim organizations, the Islamic Society of North America, Imana, American Muslim Health Professionals, and the Fiqh Council of North America, all joined together to form the National Muslim Task Force on COVID-19 back in spring when the pandemic first started spreading. Um, and this, they issued a joint statement, and this is really kind of groundbreaking within the American Muslim community because it really helped to kind of give guidance and um, give direction to not only faith leaders, but also uh, other members of our communities in terms of how they can navigate this crisis and what's the way, best way for them to be able to determine, you know, when, when is it safe to resume operations, when is it safe to allow individuals to come back to houses of worship. And so they issued a statement with specific recommendations, which was tremendously helpful um, for the thousands of mosques around the country for them to be able to share this information. And some of the recommendations they had was obviously, of course, canceling congregational prayers, canceling Sunday school or halakas, which are lectures or religious lectures, limiting meetings and using um, like web conferencing platforms like Zoom and, and what have you. And in this partic in a particular joint statement that the National Muslim Task Force of COVID-19 issued, they specifically recommended that local mosques follow public health and government guidance or social distancing. Um, and this is really imp important because we know that the impact of the pandemic varies geographically based on you know, where you're located around the country. And so someone in Florida might have a very different reality than somebody in Maryland versus somebody in New York. And then the more harder hit cities, of course, um, they are taking different precautions. And so it's really important for our communities to be able to follow that guidance from public health experts and from government officials. So many mosques, in terms of how we've adjusted, we've seen the mosques adjusting operations, we've seen a tremendous increase in online engagement. Uh, so it's, it's really kind of cute watching uncles and aunties who've never used like you know, technology before navigating Zoom. Um, but now I think everybody's pretty comfortable with, with Zoom in, in most cases um, for different virtual halakas and lectures and live casts. Um, oftentimes we, we see now boards, mosque boards are holding um, meetings online as well uh, to, to maintain safety. Uh, we're seeing in some cases, for example, on Eid, which is um, the, the two major holidays in the Islamic calendar uh, for Muslims, um, you know, typically Muslims go to the mosque to pray Eid and many mosques had canceled Eid prayers altogether. In a couple cases we saw in different states, we saw mosques offering drive-off prayer services where individuals would um, 
congregation members would go to the mosque, but they would stay in their cars or pray right next to their cars. So they're not leaving that, you know, that space and they're still physically distanced from one another, which is a very unique kind of solution, one that we wouldn't typically see, but it would, you know, you could see people thinking outside of the box. Um, and then we're also seeing a tremendous increase in community service programs. I'm not going to go through everything because I know we don't have a lot of time, but we've also seen an increase, a tremendous uptake in the number of, for example, food drives, um, health screenings, uh, you know, um, interest in wanting to fundraise to provide masks for healthcare workers, for example, especially in the beginning of the pandemic when there was a shortage of face masks, for example, Amana, one of the organizations part of the National Muslim Task Force, fundraised thousands of dollars. They purchased uh, face masks and they were able to distribute it to different hospitals that were really kind of hardest hit by the pandemic and weren't, didn't have access to PPE at the time. Um, so from an organizational standpoint, my organization, obviously like every other organization, right, adjusted our operations as well. Uh, we set up remote work from home setup. So um, we are sitting at home in our, in our um, in the comfort of our living room, uh, having conversations and the work continues. It's just the format of it has changed. A lot of our events are now online as opposed to being in person. Um, there's a much more focus on community and social services um, and educating about pandemic matters. And I'll talk in the next couple of slides a little bit about how CARE has kind of addressed that need within our communities. Um, CARE also launched the Daily Dose COVID Conversations with CARE, a live telecast that was broadcast during the thick of the pandemic uh, during the spring and summer months, where we would have different topics um, to discuss issues related to the pandemic that were of interest to not only the American Muslim community, but the broader community, because this, this is something that I think really truly um, you know, is an opportunity for faith communities to work together to find solutions for. Um, and also we launched a newsroom information portal, which allowed us to be able to communicate information on in a timely basis with our communities, especially as developments were happening during uh, the, the initial phases of the pandemic. And one of the key kind of focuses has been issuing public service campaigns and announcements and community advisories. And this has enabled us to really be able to to share information and convey content to our communities um, in a timely fashion, um, especially when things have been moving rapidly and there have been up, um, updates from the governor, governor's office and different kind of uh, local officials. It's really important to be able to share that information with the community. And so this is just a snapshot of some of the COVID conversations for CARE with um, COVID conversations, uh, live casts that CARE has held on different topics related to what do we do for Eid, right? And a lot of people were like, this is Eve. I don't want to stay at home. I want to go to the mosque. I want to be with my friends. I want to be with my family. And so, it, I mean, the, the emotional and I think the, the, um, the, the mental impact of not being able to be there in person with your community during this time can't be understated enough. Um, and I think the way that, you know, many people have started, you know, finding ways to cope is going online, right? Finding other ways to really sort of connect with one another in different ways. Um, and some of the topics that CARE covered also included international and local relief efforts, right? Like how do we, how do we serve those communities who most need um, resources, who most need supplies? We have food deserts in Baltimore, for example. How can we make sure um, that those individuals have access to food? Um, people who were at risk of eviction, right? Because they weren't able to afford rent because they'd been furloughed or they had lost their jobs. How can we support those communities? How can we educate them on how to apply for grant funding, for example, so that they're able to at least pay that month's rent and get by month to month? Um, so these were some of the topics that we sort of focused on during um, the pandemic to raise awareness. And I wanted to wrap up with a positive slide. It's so hard to find positivity like in this climate um, but I, I love, love, love this poem. Um, it's called Not Everything is Canceled. And I don't know who the author is, but I, it really kind of reminds us that in this time where there are so many things canceled, right? There, it seems like, especially even as we are being told not to go to our mosques or churches or synagogues, our houses of worship or temples, right? Um, more and more Americans are actually, studies show, research shows more and more Americans are being, feeling more connected to their faith. And the reality is that even though in these dark times, it's hard to find solace and comfort, the reality is that not everything is canceled, right? And there are so many different ways that we can find fulfillment within our lives. And, um, and I hope that, you know, through, through different faith communities working together, we can really sort of help hit that message home. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chaudhary. This was really, really good coverage of all of the work that you and your organization are doing. And I'm sure we'll come back to this. I'm particularly interested in coming back to the issues of 
um, the implications of canceling large faith events, even pilgrimages, uh, this notion of the impact on operations, day-to-day -day operation, and this notion of being isolated and, and what does one do. Uh, but I'm going to jump right in to our second speaker before we go uh, for a discussion. Professor Lori Zoloff is an American ethicist. She's currently the Margaret Burton Professor at the University of Chicago Divinity School. And most importantly, she's authored Healthcare and Ethics of Encounter, a Jewish Discussion of Social Justice, um, and has also founded the Ethics Practice, uh, which really is about advising healthcare organizations and healthcare systems. Um, um, uh, Dr. Zolak was also appointed Dean of the Chicago Divinity School. So we are really excited to have you today um, and uh, looking forward to hearing from you and from the perspective that you bring in ethics and, and Jewish studies. Over to you, uh, Dr. Zolak. Your screen. Okay. That'll be great. Yeah. Share screen. Let's see what I'm doing in. Okay. So I'm no longer dean, but um, I, what I am is a scholar. And so as a scholar, I want to say um, two things. One is thank you for that excellent presentation about Muslim uh, Islamic ethics and how the Muslim community in, the, in America is, is responding to the extraordinary challenge of the pandemic. And I'm going to say something amusing about this, which is you could just take the Islamic and Muslim references off and put in Christian or Jewish because everyone is doing exactly those things. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna talk ab about, this, the, um, about the reasons why, since we've had an excellent presentation on the technical aspects and the policy aspects of, and the implications that come out of our faith traditions. And I wanna begin because I'm a, I have training in clinical ethics um, with an actual case. And the case that confronts us now is the case of vaccines. When vaccines become available, for instance, must Jews, and you could say must believing Christians, must participants in Islamic communities, must people in faith communities be vaccinated as a matter of religious law or just as a matter of secular law? Where does religion play, or how does religion play a role in the, the, the nature of vaccines and this enormous intervention of state to person to body? And of course, state person body is, a, is the subject of bioethics. So think of that question and we're gonna go on to, to um, to the next slide, okay. So let's see, we just get rid of this here. Um, secular ethics, when we normally teach and think about secular bioethics, we think about an individual in a relationship to a state. And because secular ethics emerges from the Nuremberg principles in large part, we worry about states and the, the power of the state to impede the freedom of the individual. And so secular ethics erects a, a lot of um, protections and barriers against what might be the overwhelming power of the state resting on the autonomous individual who can say no to this sort of power. And because of this, the powerful arguments of utilitarianism, which are basically you know, they're John Stuart Mill, the core concept of an imperial state, the British imperial state, dominate public health ethics. But religious bioethics posits a community in a different relationship, not to the state, but in relationship to a God who can act and obviously cannot be limited. So I'm okay. Let's see if we can. Religion offers a different sort of language, language of the boundaries of this relationship. It offers language about sacrifice and sin, sin and redemption, not a part of secular, secular ethics or secular discourse about birth and life and death, about families and histories, about how to refuse temptation and limits, about limits on desire, limits on freedoms, um, about loving strangers and broken beings and about mortality and befallenness. Very different sets of rhetoric, rhetorical discourses than than secular ethics. Jewish ethics within this offers a distinctive method of ethics. It uses a question and response. I must say that this is also a feature of Quranic ethics. The, the um, Quran is written as a question. Have you heard? Do you know? Have you heard the story? Jewish ethics is very much like this. The rabbinic discourse is like walking into an, an inter interrupted conversation in which you're invited to become a part. Um, Questions emerge because questions are actually sent to rabbinic authorities and still to this day debated and responses given. The uh, texts are interpreted within a discursive interpretive community. There's the necessity for reason and for law. Jewish law is called the halakha. The halakha is supposed to mediate how human beings played in social settings and in personal settings. The religious law is, is the, the dominant force in Jewish ethics. And then the text itself is important. Obviously, as the Quran is central to Islamic ethics, as the New Testament is central to Christian thought, um, the Hebrew scripture and then the corpus of the Talmud and the responsa are central 
this this in within the text, there's also this notion that every marginal argument has to be taken as important as well. Jewish ethics operates with history and with custom and with memory, as we'll see. There's also these distinctive commitments in Jewish ethics. And this is a, they're interpreted differently by different thinkers, by different scholars. But I think we've come, we could make some general comments, even though it's hard to get your hands around a whole tradition, that healing is mandated and not prohibited. That the body belongs to God and not to the self. That saving life is a priority. That the natural world is morally neutral. That the natural world is broken, unfinished, and in need of our work. That no knowledge is forbidden. And that an afterlife is defined by children and memory and work. And the resurrection is only collective. And these are things that we, if, if you look at the corpus of Jewish thought, these, these things would emerge as important. Healing, I'm just gonna look at a couple of these because these are the ones that the impact on our discussion today. Healing is a commanded act. It's not just a random thing. It's, not, it's something we are commanded to do. A um, whole long theory, um, series of mitzvot, of commandments about farming, agricultural, do, are, are the source for the argument about if farming is permissible, then of course, trimming is permissible, then of course, changing nature is permissible, and of course, intervening in illness is permissible. Other texts talk about the re nature of returning of lost objects, if you have to return a lost object, you have to restore health, and you cannot stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. And then, of course, if you can't stand by the blood of your neighbor, then you can't stand by the pain of your neighbor without intervening. And that, that illness is a kind of pursuit, and if you must protect the most vulnerable from the pursuers, you must intervene in illness. The body importantly belongs to God, is to be enjoyed, is not sinful, and isn't separate from the soul. It has good appetites, and it, 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 its freedoms and desires are celebrated, but always within limits, and it's made human and honored by service. And of course, saving life is a priority. This is called the Nefesh, above all duties, even above most religious laws, the obligation to save life. The natural world is only is morally neutral. It is not the source of natural law as it is in, in, in Catholic, Roman Catholic traditions. It's not a second book. We don't depend on miracles. It's not a source of punishment and reward. And it's not particularly good. It's not a source of moral norms, in other words. And Judaism is structured around duties and not rights. So the, the notion of having rights is, is actually um, not, it, it, rights don't exist unless they're correlative with duties. The duties are to discern or to guard the unfinished world, to be readers and interpreters of texts, to participate in community, to, to have obligations to memory and above all for justice. This scarcity is a, a critical part of human existence. Therefore, what we do as Jews is to create a just order and that just order is above a natural order or established hierarchies. The corners of the field belong to the poor, that the very structure of commerce and business and relationships, economic relationships are so structured as to create a surplus. And that surplus is never to be used for profit, it's to be used for the poor because it's the, the um, structure of work itself agriculture and then by extension business, um, structures this excess because it belongs to the poor. This is actually something that's taken up by Thomas Aquinas, that the extra clothes in your in your wardrobe belong to the poor, that the money that you have in a bank or in, in a hole in the ground really belongs to the poor. That's the structure of the universe, that you are participant in the theopolitical economic structure. And finally, the justice, this justice is prior to freedom. And here's a picture of Emmanuel Levinas, an extraordinary 20th century thinker and Jewish philosopher. Justice is prior to freedom. So the, the world as a just place, the creation of justice, the relationship and duty to the other is prior always to your own self and to your, 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 any, any acts of freedom. Justice is prior to freedom. It's gonna be very important as we go on. And finally, that we have a duty as Jews in particular to remember several things. One is to remember past oppression this duty to remember past oppression is actually occurs first in Hebrew scriptures when the um, when um, Jews are, are, are required to, to think about the people who create doubt about the evil doers, the Amaleks, and they're supposed to remember how they how we they created doubt to oppress us. A very early ancient text, a scriptural text. We have a role to remember the what it's called in bioethics the shadow of history. A role to remember how scientists and doctors and the state collaborated in the murder of six million Jews and how medicine and, and, and research science and clinical, clinical research science was so fundamentally a part of this oppression. And finally, we remember that when, when you ever have Jews and plagues in the same sentence, both for the, both for the pandemic in our time, both for the, the, the Black Death and for the cholera epidemics of the early modern period, in all of those, Jews were blamed as being the source of contagion. 
And so remembering this also shapes, shapes our response. Now, looking at this theory into practice, how does this work out for COVID-19? And, and unlike our last speaker who gave us a beautiful account of the normative practices, which I say, uh, I just wanna emphasize, we all share uh, of, of communities of faith. I'm gonna look at the places where it went wrong to sort of see what we can learn from where all of my theory goes awry in actual practice. And here we have a picture of Haredi Jewish men burning mass in Brooklyn. And we can't, I can't ignore the fact that this happened. And it's really quite shocking that this happened because all the structure that we just heard about in the last talk does exist for us in the very careful curated creation of our response as a Jewish organized Jewish community. And Jewish community is very hyper-organized we, there's a, a Jewish federation in every city. People give dues to the federation. There's Jewish functionaries running everything. There's collaboration with other faiths. There's collaboration among Jews nationally across all the denominations. But yet this happened. And of course, because we, it was vividly reported in the New York Times, which is fascinated by this, this community, it, it needs some work. We have to take, do some work and say, well, what's going on with this? It's especially shocking to me as a scholar because why? because I've just told you the fundamental um, precepts of Jewish law. And I have spent years, decades actually, in other debates using the primacy of the appeal to protection of life as the final argument to approve a variety of other moral appeals. So when people wanted to do stem cell research, when people wanted to do synthetic biology, gene drives, whatever, I will always make the argument, well, if you can save a life, if the cool of nefesh, this is a permissible act. This guides even the powerful exceptions to normative ritual laws, if they might threaten life or health. And in all our debates, particularly the one around abortion in which there was um, such dissent with, between us and our, our Catholic colleagues, we used Pekuk Nefesh to say the importance of stem cell research because of this, its capacity to save lives overrides nearly every other argument. And by the way, in this, we were, we were um, joined by our, our Muslim um, colleagues. Another important reason why this is so astonishing is because of the pre precept called Dina de Mahuta Dina, which is this principle means that for Jews, obedience to the civil law of the country in which they live is viewed as religiously mandated, as religiously mandated obligation. And disobedience to the civil law is a transgression, not only of civil law, but of Jewish law too. Jews, of course, living in a, a centuries long diaspora had to figure out what to do about living in states that were not controlled by Jews. It's only since 1948 that the Jews had their own state, first time in centuries. And so we had to figure out, did you follow the rule of the, of the, of the, of the machut, of the king? And the answer was yes, you, you followed the civil law and there was an obligation to do so. So um, Jews always said no on pagans and paganism. So the powerful appeals to nature as normative are seen as a kind of paganism, a kind of nature worship. And of course, we don't want to have that in, within the center of, of Jewish life. So all of these, all this sort of anti-vaccination, you know, we don't need masks because we're, we're naturally, we're, it's all sort of naturally saved. All of those arguments should not be a part. We shouldn't be seeing them. There's also no to unlimited liberty. Jews do not prime, make pr autonomy primary, not even an unfettered individual and surely not free of community constraint. At least you're, you're, you may be free of, in some, some ways, but you're never free of the, 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 your community. Jews are not individuals in the way that John Locke considers though himself an individual. Um, even John Locke might not consider it unlimited liberty. And we understand that there has to be limits on liberty. And in, since 1909, when the cases emerged around vaccination, we've understood that you have to follow the law of the land and liberty, liberty is not expressed. Freedom is not expressed by, by, um, by a lack of limits. Secondly, the world is broken. It's in need of repair. Things are not good the way they are now. We have an obligation to heal injustice. The injustice of the world is supposed to be a primary obligation within the Jewish community. So therefore, things that happened in that, in that demonstration, um, for instance, the mocking of Black Lives Matter, completely impermissible, yet done anyway. Um, that we don't believe in local shrines. There's uh, lots of in, in script, scriptural um, admonitions against thinking that your local shrine has a divine place. There's no sacred spots where the divine is. <laughs> because much of Judaism happens in the home, within the home, or within very small home gatherings. So we shouldn't feel we need to be in synagogue. There's no need religiously or halakhically to be in a synagogue, certainly not these the modern atrocities that 
dot the landscape. Um, they're not, it's not like you have to be in the church to do something. It, so it, it's odd that people would, would fight so fiercely for that. Um, and when all else fails, there's a concept called Morris Ion, the idea that some actions ordinarily permissible are ill-advised if they might accept or confuse the, the external observer, either Jew or non-Jew, and that the actions of one are borne by all. So this, the actions of the men in the streets with the beating up people who oppose them are a horrible violation of Morris Ion, right? And yet, Yet they happen, right? So it's to oppose the wearing of masks or the closing of schools or economies or to insist on a wedding with thousands in the face of a pandemic is normally would be a straightforward halakhic matter. It would be impermissible, as would the acceptance of vaccination and before that virulation, which by the way, has been practiced by Jews and by Muslims in the Mediterranean basin for centuries, centuries. And there's no, there's no history in which Jews do not allow vaccination. Jews have embraced vaccination. Jonas Salk of polio is a hero in the Jewish community. So it's completely odd to see these anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers in the Jewish community. And how would this uh, affect a COVID response? Well, halakhic authorities immediately um, said, turn to these texts. I won't go into them here. We can talk about them later. Uh, texts in Deuteronomy, texts in Halakha that said, um, texts from Maimonides, who was of course a physician, a great court physician for both Jews and, and for Muslims in the Islamic world. Um, in the, and thinking about, um, thinking about how should Jews respond, the, the organized Jewish community did exactly what our last speaker did, said, uh-uh, this is not how we're gonna be. We have texts we can turn to, we have traditions we can turn to, and here's, we have um, people who will give us these authoritative responses. And, and by four days later, the Rabbinic Council of America, which is the leading membership organization of Orthodox rabbis in North America said, basically these people are fundamentalists. <laughs> Orthodox Jews um, do not do this. We do not dance in the street and refuse to cooperate with the law of the land. And it is, we, we, um, we wanna tell you that we're, these are not our Jewish tradition demands that we respond to these challenges with careful consideration and reason and only with peaceful protests if we don't like something, but it calls on everyone to observe all safety precautions, including the wearing of masks, proper social distancing, <laughs> and washing. So um, rejected by the normative Jewish community. A suggestion, of course, you can, we, this is, I wanted to show you a little bit about how this works. This is a, a text that was brought by Emmanuel Levinas, but it's a text in Baba Kama about, the, and, and what's interesting is it's the same text as our, um, as my Muslim colleague just, just brought forward from the Quran, um, but for it by the prophet, then the, in the way that the that, um, Jewish tradition begins to think about plague is to think about fire, right? Because it's worried about these events in the natural world, which remember morally neutral natural world can get out of hand and can be started by someone even inadvertently and then can get on of hand. Who's responsible? So for in the case of a fire, a terrible fire, a kind of California level fire consuming wood and stones and earth, you are liable for it. If you start it, you're liable for it. If the fiber breaks out and catches, even if it's in the wilderness, it eventually will come to the standing corn or the field that even a fire in some obscure place could spread to the inhabited world. And therefore, even if you just started it far out in the, wo in the woods, you're still responsible for all of the damage, the whole cascade of damage, responsible for everything that occurs, the entire cascade of destruction. And then one of the rabbis pointed out that of the same text, suddenly they begin talking about the plague, right? None of you should go outside the door of his house until morning. And as soon as freedom is given to the angel of death, he no longer distinguishes between the just and the unjust. So this, this notion that you have to stay inside because once this natural process is started, I'll wipe them out for both the righteous and the wicked. And then the rabbis actually weep the tragedy of the heart of this, of the despair of plague, the tragedy we all feel. And then another voice in the, in, um, brings this barata. Notice it's the exact same idea. If it's an epidemic in a city, don't go into it. None of you should go outside the door of your house until the morning. <clears throat> and enter your chambers and lock your doors and hide behind until the storm passes because their sword will do death without and within there should be terror. That, that notion that we have that even inside, um, we're still terrified, right? And this um, idea that Link, of course, um, to Jeremiah, the death has even come up to our windows, this overwhelming sense of what plague could mean. And what's interesting about the end of this text is we return to the fire and return to the problem of evil um, that is, is linked to this text. What do you mean things can get out of control? And in the final 
portions of this of this Talmudic text, um, God Himself, blessed be He, the Holy One, says, "Even I kindled a fire, and I will make restitution." So here, the rabbinic um, the rabbinic concern for what's happening in the world, the chaos of the world, even um, implicates God Himself. The one who sets the fire has to pay. Even the Holy One says it's incumbent on me to make restitution for the fire, which is both um, a, a, a deep questioning, it, fundamental to how Jewish law questions everything, even, even God's providence, um, but also how it ends up that there'll be restitution. So this, this very interesting double text that's, a, that's in part blame and in part anger and in part the same sort of hope that one, one sees um, at the core of all religious traditions is the concept that the stranger is your, your sibling and that the relationship to the other is both ontologically and theologically definitional. And I think that, that's where we can end with understanding the power that the stranger is your sibling is gonna be what we're gonna need in the next three months, the dark time um, that confronts us to know that, that, that both the cure both the pandemic, both the, both the vaccination is all um, understood and inhabited by people of faith as yeah. an event that's happening to our family. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Zola. That was an amazing overview, not only of, uh, of what I think is the Jewish perspective, but very importantly of a secular versus religious undertone. As you, as you stop sharing your screen, I will um, open up uh, the dialogue um, with you and uh, Dr. Chowdhury um, I, I think both of you have really done a tremendous amount of justice to our topic. At the same time, as both of you have indicated, there's a lot more to be discussed here. But let me let me begin with you, um, Dr. Chaudhary, first about asking a little bit from your perspective, building in from the operational elements that you described, the cancellation of faith services, the cancellation of even the pilgrimage. Um, what is the community dealing with in terms of COVID? What is it breeding? What is it? Uh, what are the stressors on 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 the faith community at this point in time? Because I think th this is very new, isn't it, uh, for for the community as a whole? Yeah, that's absolutely right, Dr. Heider. And one of the challenges I think is within the Muslim community, um, so many members of our communities are immigrants or who ha they have relatives in different parts of the world. Um, because this is a global pandemic, oftentimes when there are individuals who uh, do contract the virus and test positive, uh, they're not able to be there physically with their loved ones. And so that physical separation, uh, both domestically and internationally is uh, a huge um, issue to contend with. And also the fact that um, the, I think that the toll that this has taken um, or not just the Muslim community, but across the board, the mental health toll, right? A lot of people are, um, you know, they, they are tired, they're ready for 2020 to end. Um, and they're, you know, when you, when you feel removed from your spiritual community, it's hard to find, um, you know, find that kind of solace and comfort that faith often can provide. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, one of the one of the kind of responses to that that many faith leaders are, are providing for our communities is that this is an opportunity, a moment where we look inwards, not outwards. Um, and, you know, I always give the example of, you know, a diamond is starts off as a piece of coal, it comes under intense heat and pressure, and it becomes a diamond. And this, this is an opportunity, this is a test for our communities um, to really, truly, you know, build resilience and strength of character and support those who are the hardest hit by the pandemic. No, very well said, very well said. And um, Dr. Zola, in, in, in some perspective, that inner look uh, then results in people being convinced that this is something they shouldn't agree with. And that leads to the large gathering hidden from people, the people coming out in the streets because born out of that conviction. What's the tension there since you've raised it? What, what are some of the elements that we need to be really cognizant of? Because sometimes these fringe elements can mm -hmm. size and not become fringe anymore. Very unlikely, actually, the, um, the people who are in the streets are a fraction of a fraction. I'm, I'm a member of the modern Orthodox community, and these are, these are not even all the um, Haredi Jews. This is, a, a, inter, this is a, a very small group of people and in one area of the country. Notice it didn't happen in Chicago, in my city. Um, you didn't see it in Los Angeles. So, so Chicago and Los Angeles, two huge Jewish communities with um, with many of the same elements, you know, there are you know, very pious Jews, very religious Jews, complicated Orthodox communities. No one's protested in the streets. So what this was about was about politics, and it was actually it was actually a moment of of, of interfaith, right? Where there was there was funda religious fundamentalists from many different faith traditions 
um, swept up in the politics of the moment. And you, you knew that because the, the, what they were mostly reacting to was to the Black Lives Matter movement. So it, was, it, was, it had some very um, upsetting elements, political elements. And I'm, I hope you understand that these were not from the Jewish, these did not derive from Judaism. They derived from, um, ironically, for a community that's so in, that thinks it's so insular, they derived from a political reaction to the political events and to this funny notion of this reduced notion of what freedom means. This, 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 this terribly thin yeah. notion. So I, I, don't, I think it's a mistake um, to think of it as, as a, a religious movement. I think it's a fundamental political movement in the way that many fundamentalisms are. I think well said, Dr. Zolot. And of course, the Muslim faith is, uh, it recognizes that uh, in terms of a small, tiny percentage then being yeah. taken to represent. But Dr. Chaudhary, just to build on what um, Dr. Zolop was saying, has your organization or you reached out to communities of other faiths? Has there been more action in the times of COVID? Uh, some of our comments on the chat board are asking about, is this an opportunity? I'd like you to comment and then I'll also ask the same question from Dr. Zolop. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and just to add a little bit to what Dr. Zolop mentioned earlier, um, I think one of the questions in the chat commented on the fact that they were people were seeing many Muslim weddings where people were still gathering in large numbers. And I wanted to kind of touch on that because um, you know it, it's really important to also be conscious of our own inner bias when we make comments like that, that implies that it's the Muslim community who's you know, kind of like resisting or flouting like these uh, these principles of social distancing. We are seeing this across faith traditions, and um, and even though it is a, a small proportion of, of the population, um, unfortunately, it does kind of make you know make it very difficult for everybody to be able to be safe in these times. Um, in terms of the opportunity to work across faith uh, traditions, absolutely. Um, for, for just to give you an example here in Maryland, for example. Uh, CARE has seen different mosques, churches, and synagogues working together to uh, appeal to the government, for example, when they make decisions on reopening houses of worship. Um, these are decisions that impact every house of worship across the board. Um, and I think through Dr. Zalat's presentation, we saw that there are so many commonalities. I mean, I personally was struck by the fact that, you know, there are so many similarities amongst the faith traditions. And whenever I do interfaith you know, work, I always, you know, I'm struck by how much, you know, we have more in common and we have what sets us apart. And I think when we see this kind of pandemic where, you know, all of us are impacted across the board, there really truly is an opportunity for, for us to harness that collective kind of conscience and find opportunities for us to uplift not only our own community, but we do see that we are a globally interconnected society. And so there have been mosques and churches and synagogues working together um, to appeal with elected officials when um, the protocol that they're establishing on a timeline for when houses of worship will safely reopen, um, the dissemination and distribution of PPE, especially in those communities who have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, especially uh, communities of color, as we've seen the racial disparity that's been revealed by the pandemic. Um, and I think it's really created more of a conscience, a uh, global conscience in terms of the, the fact that communities of colors of color have historically been marginalized, right? And we see this none more so than during these kind of crises where we see um, the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on especially black and Hispanic communities. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zola, so just on the same theme, is COVID a time to bridge these communities and work together? Well, um, like my colleague, I've been working in an interfaith manner for across this pandemic, um, meeting actually weekly with a uh, small group of scholars from around the world um, at a ridiculously early hour in the morning in Chicago um, to talk about what texts might be useful for us and how we, how we, you know, moving from anger to lamentation to to um, to the notion of plague and what a plague historically meant. So I, I think there's been a very rich scholarly discourse. And in terms of community, I actually, I want more. Um, I think the big test for our society is gonna be the vaccinations. When there's scarcity, there is gonna be tension. And I think it's gonna be a real test for faith communities to be able to keep remembering the thing we hold in common is that we do believe that, um, that we are siblings, <laughs> that none of us, you know, that, that, that God is paternal or maternal. And, and we are siblings and that's that our essential equality, our human rights for Jefferson and for the DS who put together our constitution came because we're siblings from a benevolent God, right? Um, who they didn't quite define and didn't want to, to organize religion around, but they did want to keep the notion of rights, an idea of in the individual rights 
and do these bootleg from, from Jewish and Christian and Islamic traditions. So that's very important. We're gonna, I think faith communities are gonna be central to figuring out how to give out a scarce life and death resource with justice. And I don't, I think it's too important to leave it, forgive me, <laughs> to the public health people because the public <laughs> health people will honor their tradition and yep. their tradition is utilitarianism. You know, it's, it's, and that's the way to run a British empire. It worked really well for John Stuart Mill. <laughs> Unfortunately, it also endorsed slavery, alas. Um, so, so, so re religious traditions can say, but what about, what about the stranger? What about, what, what do we owe the elderly? What sort of promises do we make to the elderly? Um, what, what role does poverty have in our theopolitical right. economy? So d these other questions beyond utilitarianism that we might want to consider um, for the distribution and to keep people on the same during a period in which the death rate will go up and the vaccine will be coming in. And how, how, how do we make sure that that disconnect, that terrible months long disconnect, months and months of disconnect um, will be mediated and understood and so that's one thing. Secondly, is that um, religion offers an account of sin and evil that we've kind of lost track of in, in secular societies. And we tend to turn against each other and see the other as the problem. And in, we have to really sort that out. That's, something, that, that's some work that still needs to be done in faith communities. But I do think it's gonna be terribly important at this for faith communities to work together and to then especially since the, after the Supreme Court decision, which seemed to privilege faith communities and maybe terrify governors into not putting restrictions on gatherings, it's important for faith leaders, as faith leaders to say, um, in fact, you don't want to be in a place where people are singing together and chanting right. together and crowded That's together. Right. And That's the right. very things that make, that, that in fact, faith, faith um, gatherings are different from going into the hardware store. Yeah. And, and it, but it has to be faith leaders who say that and who lead Absolutely. The Absolutely. And, and, and just to say that utilitarianism isn't the only thing driving public health. Some of us are interested in it. And I know you didn't mean that. There's but, in there. You should have a mental <laughs> And equity and, and so on. But, but my final question to you, Dr. Chaudhry, and, and, and you, can, you can throw in any final reflections on this one as you will, is really what are some of the principles that you think that uh, the Islamic faith offers with respect to handling this pandemic, with respect to even the issue of vaccine, whether it's vulnerability or respect for the elderly, or it's the the uh, the, the notions of the prophet and how he treated others, etc. Um, just some reflections on that would be very helpful from your perspective. Absolutely. So one of the key kind of principles or tenets of the Islamic faith is sanctity of human life. And I think at the end of the day, that's what everything boils down to in terms of what faith leaders are doing uh, within the Muslim faith tradition, um, how they are responding to feedback and criticism or, uh, you know, outcry from um, members of their congregation who might be concerned about the fact that mosques are closed for prayers. Um, the, the fact that sanctity of life is paramount uh, and not just Muslim life, but all life, right? All life is paramount um, within the Islamic faith tradition and the need to protect our communities our, and to protect life is at the top of that list. Um, and I think that the point with the vaccine that I really wanted to kind of highlight is the, the scarcity is scarcity, is, scarcity, excuse me, is an issue as well, but also um, the, the skepticism related to the vaccine is going to be an obstacle as well. We know, for example, with the Tuskegee experiment where you know, African-American communities were disproportionately harmed and impacted, um, that has led to skepticism, for example, within the African-American community. And that community has been one of the most hardest hit by this pandemic. So how do we overcome some of these skepticism, the bias, the fears, the concerns about the efficacy of the vaccine itself and how it's going to impact these populations is also going to be something that's fundamental, not only for public health experts, but also government officials and faith leaders, because faith leaders have such a critical role to play in making sure that our communities are doing the right thing, not only for themselves, but also for broader society. Um, and I think that, um, you know, moving forward, having these conversations within faith groups uh, is, is really a very critical part of making sure that um, each and every one of us is doing our role, doing our part to ensure the safety of, of not only ourselves and our own families, but collectively uh, of all of humanity. And while there are obstacles, faith is truly, I think, um, you know, a, a resource and, and, and it's an opportunity for us to be able to draw strength from 
and really truly build bridges of cooperation, um, even especially in times where we have, for example, the president of the United States, right, calling the virus a China virus. The racism and the skepticism that's coming from you know, top level officials is something that faith leaders also need to contend with and set the right tone in terms of making sure that our communities understand that we can't resort to these uh, racist fear mongering and scapegoating and these racist tropes um, to, you know, to sort of move our communities forward and, and emerge from this pandemic as strong as possible. No, that's great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, for that perspective. And, and, and finally, to you, Dr. Zolat, um, in addition to any final reflections, I, I would like you to make a comment on what you said about duties versus rights. <laughs> and, and, and is this a time where we emphasize our duties compared to our rights, um, particularly taking from the Jewish tradition? Absolutely. I mean, I, I have been appalled as, um, as a, a baby boomer who had a father, a little, you know, my, my, my small Jewish father who went off to fight a war in the Pacific um, because he felt he had to, he had to, because he had to defend freedom, right? And that the grand idea of freedom, the enormity of the idea of freedom, um, the beauty of the idea of American freedom and democracy is, is so, it's so tawdry to think it's like a, like the freedom not to wear a mask. It's just ridiculous, just absurd, right? And so and if you think about life as, um, as a series of rights that um, you always have to defend, right? And it might be taken from you and you're a victim of your loss of your rights. Um, you're really missing the point of what human existence is about. Human existence is about the suffering of the other. What must I do about the suffering of the other? And how do I live um, in a world in which the suffering of others is so apparent? And we're supposed to be called um, by God into response to that. We have a duty, we're born into that duty. And that notion of a duty, um, and rights is only correlative to those duties is really important. This notion that you, you, know, that there's, you would not um, be willing to give your life for something is a very disturbing idea. It's a, it's a diminution of the American spirit um, and certainly a diminution of, of centuries of Judaism, um, Christianity and Islam, where people were really um, willing to give their lives for freedom, give their lives for democracy, give their lives for the, the capacity to experience God in their own way. Absolutely. So, so we have, to, we have to remember that over and over again, the grand, the grand vision of what freedom can be no. and, and resist, the, resist the diminution of the freedom. No, thank you for that reminder, incredibly important. And um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid time's up. And so we are gonna start winding down. I just, uh, before I thank our speakers, I want you to know that um, today we've had uh, a brief opportunity to look at two faith traditions, the Islamic faith tradition, and uh, the Jewish faith tradition from two of our panelists. We hope in this series now to include uh, many other faith traditions. So watch out uh, for this space in 2021. We hope to bring in um, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Confucius, the secular humanists and so on uh, in this series and, and see the COVID-19 is not going anywhere in 2021. It will be very much with, with us. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Chaudhary and Dr. Zolot you not only have contributed to the perspectives that you come from, but also to the general idea of a shared humanity and of some shared ethics principles that come and, and are rooted in a religious tradition. Uh, so this is not something that we have to fear. It is not something that we have to be uh, closing down in terms of building our walls, but really opening up the bridges and the pathways as, as some of our um, panelists said on the uh, participants said on the chat board. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, I would like to let you know that we will be taking a break for a month. We will come back in January 2021 for our 19th webinar. Watch this space for the new announcements. It's been an incredible run. This was our 18th webinar on ethics and COVID and a wonderful way to close before the holidays uh, with the wonderful participation of our two panelists. Thank you all uh, a lot for being with us today and looking forward to having many of you again in the new year. Thank you, Dr. Zola. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary and wonderful. Wish everyone safe and happy holidays. Thanks for Thank you so much. Have a safe holiday season. Happy New Year. Yes.